Father, we do come to you tonight, Father, and we know that there are many out there that have a, a lot of burdens on them tonight and that have a heavy heart for our family and our friends, Father, those that are suffering in their bodies and sick, Father, and just um, can't seem to get well, can't seem to recover, but we know that you can help and you can recover and you can, you can take back what this world's taken from us. And we just ask, Father, that you touch these people, that you touch their bodies, their minds, their souls, their spirits tonight. We lift them each and every one up to you. You know the special need that they have, Father. You know how to intervene, how to intercede, Father, in every situation, every circumstance. Things that we can't even imagine, Father, that you can do. We give all things over to you. We know, Father, that your will will be done. We pray tonight, Father, that we understand, that we accept, and we follow your will and your way in everything. Father, we praise you for the miracles that, that happen every day, some things that we don't even realize. But there's others that are just obvious. And we pause and acknowledge you and thank you for it. Father, we ask you tonight for a special blessing on this church service. We ask for your anointing to be on the lips of those that will sing. Be with the word tonight. Help us all to open our hearts to you and to the movement of the Holy Spirit tonight. Guide us, help us, fill us tonight, Father. Bless our offering tonight. Bless all aspects of this service. And I thank you tonight in Jesus' precious, holy name. Amen. certain days because he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know to victory. 
my soul, something happened, and now I know he touched me. and made me whole. I will never cease to praise Him. I'll shout it while eternity rolls. He touched me. floods my soul. Something happened and now I know he touched me and made me Interesting melody. <laughs> I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis a melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody there. Rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody of love. I love the Christ who died on Calvary. For he washed my sins away. He put within my heart a melody and I know it's there to stay in my heart there rings a melody there rings a melody with heaven's harmony in my heart there rings a melody there rings a melody of love will be my endless theme in glory with the angels I will sing will be a song with glorious harmony when the courts of heaven ring in my heart there rings a 
a melody there rings a melody with heaven's harmony in my heart there rings a melody there rings a melody of love Amen. and this is true for you even if you don't know the the, the song just, just, just say the words out loud tonight. Let's let this be our testimony as well. Give the, give the enemy an old black eye tonight. Amazing grace, oh how sweet the sound that saved a poor sinner like me. Though once I was lost, yet now I'm found. Though I was blinded, now I see. And it's all because of God's amazing grace. Because on Calvary's mountain, he took my place, and someday, some glorious morning, I shall see him face to face, all because of God's amazing grace. Through disappointment and days,
That's why I sing all my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterday's gone. All my sins are forgiven. I've been washed by the kind of thing that just breaks a man, breaks him down to his knees, God, I've been broken down a time or two, but you pick me up and you show me what it means. of Jesus, how he was born in Bethlehem, and we remind ourselves of Calvary, and how he died for fellow man, seldom do we speak of when he'll return.
power, power, one working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. to Romans chapter 5 tonight. Um, if you remember, from, uh, it's probably been a, almost a month now, um, we've been going through the book of Romans and we made it through chapter 4 and now we're going to start on chapter 5 and tonight we're going to try to look at the first 11 verses of that chapter and um, if you'll recall where we were at before, Paul had spent those first four chapters going over some things with the, with the people there at the church and if you remember the um, the Church of Rome was kind of a, a kind of like a little conglomeration of different groups of people. You had Jewish people in the church, and then you had a lot of Gentiles in the church. And Rome was probably one of the most pagan cities that there was at that time. And and there was a large number of people there that weren't Jewish. It was uh, they outnumbered the people greatly in the town there, or actually in the whole city, state, nation, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the the pagans or the Gentiles or what we would call them, they outnumbered the people and and as a result the church there began to grow but it began to grow in the number of Gentiles as opposed to being uh, most of the churches predominantly at that time were were made up of a lot of Jews that had converted over to Christianity and the church there in Rome was the same way but it was starting to um, um, kind of um, change and shift a little bit to where it was becoming more of a Gentile church than a, than a Jewish church, if you want to kind of put it that way. And, and Paul had been dealing with some things there because the, uh, the Jewish people in the church were still the leaders of the church, and, and they were the ones that had the influence in the church. They were a, kind of what I would call the old guard that had been there since the beginning of it, and they were the ones that... Um, they kind of set the rules, and what they had been doing is they had been intermingling all these Jewish traditions and, and making these traditions a, um, a condition of their salvation and, and all these things. And Paul had been combating that and trying to get them to understand that your traditions are not going to save you. He was trying to get them to understand that it didn't matter um, if you um, were of the Jewish traditions or if you were even of the Gentile traditions. Those traditions were not going to save any of them. That the only way any of them were going to be saved was through the grace and the, and the faith in Jesus Christ. And, and so he was trying to get them to understand that. And he did spend some time going over the Jewish traditions and how they did serve a purpose and they were important, but they weren't the, the saving factor to the people there. And, and he, had, um, he wanted them to really understand and he wanted to establish this um, understanding of the fact that, that there is only one way to God, and that one way to God was through Jesus for everybody. And there wasn't two classes of Christians. There wasn't the, um, the, the better Christians and the not-so-good Christians. And, and um, <clears throat> we tend to do that ourselves, to be honest with you, in the church. We'll have people that have been part of the church for years and years and generations and generations, and, and, and they will um, kind of... Um, look at younger or newer Christians sometimes in ways and, and say, well, they're not as good as we are because they've not been a Christian as long as we have. Uh, no, that's not, no. We're all saved by faith in Jesus Christ. We're all delivered in Jesus Christ. And, I, and, and there are Christians of all different ages and groups and, and maturity levels, but we're all saved by the same Christ. 
And he's wanting them all to, to understand that because he wants them all to be able to stand righteous before God. And he spends time talking about this righteousness before God and what it takes to be you know, considered righteous before God. And, and he, he sends all this time doing that because he wants them to get and understand that, <coughs> that, that they don't have to wait for the benefits of their salvation when they die. You know, we think that, that we're, there's no benefit to our salvation. It's only toil and trouble and, and all the heartache and all the things that come along with life and just trying to endure through it and, all, and only blessings and rewards come after we die and after we leave this world. That is not the case at all. And that's not the case that, that Paul's trying to set for them. He is saying there are some benefits to being, being a Christian, the benefits to being righteous before God, benefits to... To, to understand and having a relationship with Christ that you can, you can have right now. You can have today. You can have throughout the rest of your life. And that's what he's trying to get them to understand. And that's where he's going to kind of move into this different direction with this scripture that we're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to read it here. Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 1, says this. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. And that's the key. That's the one thing I'm going to talk about. This peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of the Lord. You know, we don't do that. We don't rejoice in the glory of the Lord like we should. We don't rejoice as Christians like we should. We just don't. We don't rejoice at all anymore. We should rejoice in the fact that Jesus Christ has saved us. We should rejoice in the fact that he delivers us every single day. We should rejoice in the fact that we have an eternity, that we have hope in the eternity that is heaven. We should rejoice in that. There should be joy in that. He says, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. He says, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And guess what? We are the ungodly. We are the ones that Christ died for. He says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his love, his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, Christ didn't die for you because you were righteous. Christ didn't die for you because you, were, you, were, you had it all together. He died for us while we were still sinners, while we were unrighteous, while we were undone. While we had no hope, Christ died for us. And it says, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, you hear that? Not if we were God's enemies, he says when you were God's enemy. See, without Christ, we are enemies of God. You don't want to be an enemy of God. He says, for if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. He keeps saying reconciliation, being reconciled, because without Jesus, we are not reconciled with God. We have no relationship with God. We are nothing. We are hopeless. But through Jesus, it's all restored. And that hope of eternity is restored. But he starts out here. I'm going to go back and pick up in the beginning. He starts out there saying, therefore. He says, therefore. And he's making a declaration. He's making a statement. And he's really saying, therefore, uh, it, says barely, it means because of all of this, because of all this stuff that we just uh, kind of summarize and, and what he covered in these first four chapters here. He says, because of all of this, he says, it's obvious. It's obvious to come to the conclusion that since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And he's wanting them to understand peace, what peace really is. So we think about peace, we think about things like world peace, don't we? Oh, we're always striving for world peace, aren't we? We don't understand what real peace is. The world has no idea what peace is. This world will never, ever, ever, ever establish world peace. You know why? Because this world is overcome by sin. It's overcome by darkness. And it's ignoring what it takes to actually have peace. We want to come up with all these ideas and all these things about, oh, we're going to do this for peace. We're going to do that for peace. There is no peace apart from God. There is no peace apart from Christ. The two are not. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have peace because it's not compatible. We have all these religions, and these religions are not new. These ideas are not new. They talk about inner peace. You ever heard of, let's find our inner peace. Let's go and bend our leg behind our back and meditate for two hours and find our inner peace. Let's smoke a bunch of dope and find our inner peace. Let's get high. I never understood how somebody get high and find inner peace. It just makes you paranoid. But we're going to find inner peace. We're going to go, oh, why they, oh. Well, you're just looking silly then. No, inner peace. You see, everybody's looking for inner peace because everybody is looking for God. Everybody's looking for God because there is an emptiness. There is a turmoil in all this inner just a turmoil that goes on this war inside of all of us. And we're all looking for peace from all of that. The only peace is Jesus. Only peace. Here's some Greek for you. The word for peace is irene. Is that irene? Did I, did I pronounce that right, Dennis? He's shaking his head, yeah. <laughs> irene. <laughs> And it means, I looked up the meaning, it says, and literally it says, to join or with one, to join with one. To be brought into prosperity, quietness, rest. To set at one again. And it all points to reconciliation with God. And it's this concept of being joined once again with God. Brought into prosperity and rest and quietness with God. That's what peace really is. You know, the Bible says that peace that passes all understanding. And see, the world can't understand it because the world can't. We have to experience it. You can't explain it to people. You have to experience it. It's, it implies things being set right between humanity and God. It's where those inner battles are brought under subjection. It's where true victory is won. For all these things that we have to have to endure in this life, we can still have peace. Peace through it. Now, I'm not talking about all everything being all good, but we have peace. But there's a flip side of that too. I'm going to skip down to verse three because he says this: Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom He has given us. And that don't make a lick of sense on the surface. If you don't have Jesus, that makes absolutely no sense to anybody. It says rejoice in your sufferings. Who wants to rejoice? Anybody want to rejoice when they're suffering? They say, praise the Lord, I'm broke. <laughs> or hallelujah, I'm sick. We don't do that. That don't make sense. But he's saying there is a deeper purpose, a deeper meaning. There is a deeper thing that goes on. And it, and it takes place in, in, in Christians. And, and those that are without Christ, they don't understand it. He says, when you, when you rejoice in those things and, and, and when you, when you have, have hope and faith and trust and have, have peace through those things, he says it, it changes some things. Because it's not about rejoicing and having hope and all that in the things of this world. It's eternal hope, eternal peace. Knowing that whatever happens, whatever goes on, whatever takes place, it's all going to be okay. 
It's all going to be okay. And, and it's not just for us either. It's for all those that are watching us. All those that are looking at us as an example. Want to see, well, how are they going to react? Oh, how are they going to act? When things go south. When things aren't going so good. See, the world watches. Because they want to know. We're talking all this Jesus stuff, all this hope and love and peace stuff. What happens when things go bad in our lives? We're going to hold on to that or we're going to go back to the ways of the world? That's what the world really wants to see. And we're the example. The example to the world. Not of what we are, but what we should be. That's not easy. It's not easy. It's not an easy path. None of us. We have to do it. And it takes having complete trust and complete faith in God to be able to endure it. And I've seen a lot of people suffer. I've seen people who are Christians suffer. I've seen people who are not Christians suffer. And there's a marked difference in how they endure that suffering. A complete difference. I've seen a lot of people mourn loss. A lot of people. And there's a complete difference in how a Christian mourns and how a non-believer mourns. And it's Morning's not good. It's bad all the way around. I'd be a fool to stand up here and tell you any different. There's nothing good about it. See, the difference is Christians mourn for other Christians because they miss them. Simple as that, because they miss them. See, non-believers mourn because they have no hope. And there's the difference. There is no hope. those that die without the Lord there's no hope for them either and we can try to fool ourselves we can lie to ourselves we can we can say all kinds of things and make up all kinds of things but deep down every single person knows the truth knows the truth because it's it's inside of us that yearning that longing for God is inside of us and when we when we when, when we know that the person laying there in that casket in front of us did not have a relationship with God, then you get a sense of just hopelessness. Total hopelessness. And our job then, we have a job. We have a responsibility is to uphold the gospel of Jesus Christ, even in those awful, horrible times to share the hope of God with other people. The greatest testimony for someone that's been a Christian that's left this world is their relationship with Jesus. To be able to stand and declare this person is with God because they follow Jesus. people that set out in the audience of the kingdom. I don't call it a congregation, it's an audience. You see all kinds of things at a funeral. All kinds of things. But to be able to offer them that same hope. See, we should be doing that every single day. I'm going to challenge you to do something this week. The next time you go out to the store or out to a restaurant or somewhere, just look. Just look. Don't, you don't have to say anything. Just look. Look at the people's faces. Look at the hopelessness that's on their faces. They're just beaten down. The people we encounter every single day are just beaten down in hopelessness. But you know, we have the key to restore that hope. We have the ability to do that. 
That is the power of the Holy Spirit, but we have to be able to unleash that power. We have to have some hope ourselves. We have to understand what the peace of God really is. We have to experience it. And we only experience it when we have a relationship with Jesus. And we stand firm in that relationship. That's what it's really all about. It says that hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. And then He goes on and He talks about, I'm just going to summarize what He he talks about Jesus coming. And see, he, he goes through all this, and then he tells them, you know, this is the message you're supposed to give to people. You're supposed to tell them how Jesus came. And it says, at just the right time, not a minute too late, not a minute too early, he died for us. See, at just the right time, when we need God the most, he is going to be there. He is not going to let us down. He is not going to disappoint us. He is not going to turn his back on us he will be there at just the right time Paul saying tell them this message give them this message share this hope and he goes on he says very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man though for a good man some might possibly dare to die but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were yet sinners Christ died for us See, people beat other people up all day long, all week long. It's no wonder that everybody walks around like this all the time. Because the world absolutely tries to beat them down. Say, you're not worthy. You're not worth, worth anything. That's what the world will tell us. Jesus does not say. He says, even in your worst state, I died for you. I died so you could live. That's not hope. There's nothing else that can give us hope. Jesus. Knowing that it's all going to be okay. Do you believe that tonight? Do you believe that it's all going to be okay in the end? That's really what we need to hold on to. Because I'm going to tell you. Well, y'all know just as well, some of you better than I do. This world's going to throw some awful things at you. But if you don't believe and know that in the end it's all going to be okay, then you're going to find yourself out there lost. You know, we talk about people being lost, it, and we say, oh, you know, that just, that gets a bad name, really, than the word lost. It really is what people are. They're just lost. They're looking for God and they're lost. And we need to help them find their way home. That's our job. That's our role. That's His task. But we need to know where we're going first, though. We need to know what direction our life's going. We need to spend time reflecting. we figure out where we're going then just maybe just maybe we can help some other people find their way home as well we're all going to the same destination that's where we all want to be we need to help others get there just because we've made it doesn't mean that we can sit down and wait for the bus to get here there's other people we truly love God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and love our neighbor as ourselves. And we will do whatever's in our power to share the gospel. I'm going to quit there. I'm not going to do an altar sir. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to pray. So I think what's been said has been said. What needs to be said has been said. I'm going to dismiss us. And you all really need to just think about it. Where you are with Christ and where Christ wants you to be. Because I see it week after week after week after week. People come in here hopeless, downtrodden, and walk out of here the exact same way as they came through the door. 
all the people who are unwilling to just give themselves over to God. And I could, I could have them up here singing songs to the cows come home. It's not going to change a thing. It's a decision that we all have to make. I'm going to pray and dismiss. If you need to come and pray while I'm dismissing, don't hesitate. Don't. Just because service is ending. Don't worry about any of that. You just need to be obedient to God. Let's pray. Pray with me, please. Father, we do come tonight. I do thank you one more time, Father, for being with us and helping us tonight and opening our eyes and our hearts. And I just pray, Father, that this word sinks in and penetrates and gets to the depths of our soul tonight. I ask you, Father, to guide us and deliver us this week and go with us and help us. Show us, Father, the way you want us to go. And I thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.